Okay, so good afternoon. So we will start with uh, Arthur Miller and introduction to Arthur Miller, American playwright who according uh, uh, along with uh, Tennessee Williams, Eugene O'Neill and also uh, to a lesser extent um, along with uh, Thornton Wilder and Edward L.B. is uh, one of the greatest playwright, American playwright of the 20th century. He was born um, in uh, 1915 and died quite recently in 2005. So those are the dates, 1917 to 2005. Now um, he is, he was born in a Jew family, a uh, trading family. His father was a, a manufacturer of women's hats. Okay. Nowadays, you have such kinds of uh, questions also for competitive exams. So, I thought it is uh, uh, all right to include a biographical detail like this one. Um, he has uh, or he had an older brother, Kermin, and a younger sister who is also an actress on theater act uh, on stage. And, uh, um, during because you know the dates 1917 so when he was 12 years the great depression hit america and the family lost much of its fortunes so that was one of the most formative influences on arthur miller the great depression and many of his plays deal with this idea or this concept of families uh, the disintegration of family values, family systems, family relationships with the decline in family fortunes. Um, this is the house the family shifted to after Winger. they lived in a Upper East Ma Manhattan which uh, belongs to very wealthy people, but uh, once they lost their money they were forced to shift to uh, you know lesser uh, postal address and that is in Brooklyn. So, this is uh, Arthur Miller's house in Brooklyn where he lived with his family for a long time. <coughs> and um, uh, it is also, I mean Miller also notes in his uh, autobiography, he has written a very classic, very um, renowned autobiography called Time Bends, Time Bends, where he uh, n uh, observes how the change in life. <coughs> change in his fortunes um, also resulted in change in the attitude of his relatives. Okay. For a uh, long time, he worked as a newspaper boy, he would deliver newspapers and also he would, uh, he worked in a warehouse. Okay. Uh, you know what is a warehouse? Yeah. And all those things have uh, come to find a place in his, some of his plays. Okay, for example, he wrote a play called A Memory of Two Mondays, which is all you know very extremely autobiographical and which has traces of his own life when he worked as a young boy in a warehouse and, the, and as a newspaper delivery boy. Okay. He uh, attended University of Michigan and uh, studied journalism for quite a while and then at University of Michigan, he got interested in writing plays. Okay. So, there was a, a creative writing and playwriting workshop uh, courses there. He attended many of them and he started writing plays. Most of his plays focus and this is interesting, father, son and brother, brother relationship. So, he had a sister, he was very close to his mother, but women hardly ever have an important role except uh, as mother figure, so maternal figures. So, you can apply, you know, and mothers are always idealized, they are the all sacrificing women. Perhaps this is what he had seen in his own mother who had to shift, who had to go and undergo a tremendous shift in lifestyle after how, uh, after the father lost his income and all. So, maybe that has reflected, but most often he, uh, and therefore, this is what I meant by the Greek influence. Now, you have done Oedipus and you have done, you are familiar with Greek elements okay, and Greek uh, dramaturgy. So, it is basically the confrontation, the conflict between fathers 
and sons and brothers and brothers okay and some of his earlier plays were focused on this aspect of human relationships so he is a play uh, he is a playwright of human relationships but he is also a deeply political playwright okay for example i will soon talk about the crucible and his confrontation with house and american activities committee okay so um he uh, one of his earliest job was to write uh, scripts for radio programs radio was big those days we are talking about those days so before television it was radio and he wrote a number of successful plays for the radio uh, and then you are also aware of the uh, formation or the foundation of the group theater are you aware have we talked about the group theater okay so you have you are um, the group theater uh, was a leftist kind of an organization it was established in uh, the early 30s three founding fathers lee stressberg cheryl crawford and harold clurman okay and it was an attempt to create a collective kind of theater now what do you understand by theater collective these kinds of these this is a very socialistic kind of uh, approach to theater where people sit they write their plays they do not hope or expect to earn profits from play writing okay the idea is to um, convey a certain kind of idea or ideology the ideologically driven theater and most of them were extreme left in their ideologies at that time it was uh, they wanted to present contemporary plays about contemporary issues what was uh, ailing america at that time now you see what was ailing america at that time they had just gotten out of this first world war and they had been plunged into the great depression people were losing jobs people were committing suicides okay at the same time you had lot of cultural uh, shifts and changes happening in american society so the group addressed these issues so one of the most important playwright of this period before uh, so arthur miller was just a new entrant to the because just imagine it was formed in 1931 and he must have been hardly 14 years old at that time right so he was not a part of the group theater but he was immensely aff uh, affected or influenced by the ideologies of the group the theater collective socialist theater so um the members as i was telling you they held left wing political views and wanted to create uh, create or uh, produce plays that were socially important and relevant and then there is also another important issue or concept here uh, the introduction of the method you become get into the skin of the role that is the idea so that is the method stanislavski in russia introduced the concept in america it found fertile soils in the works of people like lee stressberg who was the most important practitioner of the method okay you you know these things so again a system of training and rehearsal for actors and they were asked to base their performance drawing on their inner emotional experiences so it was extremely uh, draining for actors you have to tap in inside your own hidden resources in order to or experiences how did you i mean you are acting uh, enacting a scene where you there is you have to portray the feelings of someone who has just lo lost a loved one so you have to um, plumb deep into your feelings and think of a situation where you actually lost someone very close to you maybe died okay so bring out those kinds of emotions and associate with the role so people had nervous breakdowns while doing such kinds of but you know it paid div great dividends because it worked okay so you know some of the earliest practitioners of this uh, style of acting there is a, a, how many people can you think of practitioners of the method acting not 
do not name the more recent contemporaries. Let us talk about the 40s and the 50s. Yeah, Marilyn Brando came um, during the 50s, came along on the, the yeah. But there was an uh, there was an actress called Talula Bankhead, who he's yeah she was a great great theater actress, Talula Bankhead. Um, she and uh, um, she did not do very well in cinema because uh, naturally she was so good on stage that he, she always c considered cinema. Uh, below her dignity and she never paid much attention to building a great cinematic career for herself. Okay. But then at a later stage you had people and remember all these things were happening in New York. So, there is always that uh, distinction between LA style and New York style of acting. So, when you think of people who are actually considered great stars Elizabeth Taylor, Marilyn Monroe, they had nothing to do with the method, it was all glamour, the LA glamour. Okay. Whereas, people who come from the New, New York school of acting, okay, who have worked for a while in the on stage in the theatre and they have been trained specially. Okay. So, they were always considered a cut above. So, some of the earlier practitioners at least on uh, in Hollywood on screen, they were Marilyn Brando as you know, also um, Monty Clift, Montgomery Clift, you have already seen a place in the sun, right. He was, uh, he came from the same school of acting, method acting and also James Dean. There were few women who practiced method, but uh, uh, later on there were women actors also, especially when the American new wave started that we are not concerned with that right now. Uh, the group theatre disbanded in the early 40s and after the second world war and this is very important, most of the members because they had such a strong leftist tendencies, they were uh, investigated by the House Un-American Activities Committee. Okay, so, this is and that is the point when it started the late 40s and the early 50s. You remember those dates the late 40s, the mid 40s onwards um, HUAC was at its peak and um, there were some people who um, sort of testified and named the members of the group theatre. Now, what would happen if you name names? What would happen to the person whose name you testify before a committee as dreaded as HUAC and you name them that yes, they are former communists and they have they hold leftist liberal views. What happens to them? They were sort of blacklisted. Okay, so it was a, a crime against. Uh, the nation, yeah, to be a leftist. Okay, so it's like it. Uh, why uh, America was in the throngs of such kind of paranoia? One reason because of the Cold War. Okay, the Cold War as was at its peak, and the idea was that anyone who harbors leftist tendencies has to be anti-national, anti-American. So that was the kind of you know dread or paranoia that was prevalent in America during those times. So, uh, they had their own justification of being of coming down so heavily on the so called liberals and leftists because you are the allegation was that they are practicing anti national acts and practices. So, some prominent people who testified they were they were the ones who actually uh, uh, let us call them they let down the ideals of what the group theatre and also federal theatre project um, things like that stood for. So, Alaya Kazan the great film director, Clifford Audits one of the greatest ever playwrights and he was actually he was the one who was uh, one of the most important most prominent personalities of the group theatre. Okay, so, Clifford Audits, Alaya Kazan and also Lee Jacob, Lee Jacob was an actor and they all testified and named 
other members of left wing groups ok and I they saved themselves, but they sold out their comrades. So, that is one. So, I am sure you know what uh, the kind of work Elia Kazan is, then we I keep referring to them to him and his work in a film studies class. So, uh, he is the director of On the Waterfront, which is again a response to uh, HUAC, not exactly a response, <coughs> but once he named names, he was also sort of blacklisted by the left group. Okay, so, there is a blacklist for everyone. Okay, so, it's a, I, it's, there are such a strong binaries you are against or with them. So, he was left the back blacklisted by his by the uh, left liberals. Now, uh, uh, on the waterfront is considered a response to the left liberals. It sometimes he is saying that sometimes it is all right to be um, uh, a rat it really does not matter because you are doing it for the right cause, for the right reason. Clifford Audits, he is the author of or he is a playwright of the one of the greatest leftist plays, it is called Waiting for Lefty, Waiting for Lefty. He is also the author of Awake and Sing, so all very aggressive, very militant plays about left liberal ideas very successful, did extremely well um, uh, for very long time and has written a, and collaborated on a couple of uh, Hollywood scripts as well, a much in demand person. But then again he named names and uh, he died of a broken heart because he was also rejected by his peers. And Lee Jacob, he was also a prominent actor. Per, uh, on stage particularly. In films, perhaps some of you are familiar with 12 Angry Men. He is the man, he is the man who stands apart from the, you know, at the end there is one man who keeps on, who is very adamant that yes, I am not going to change my stance. He is the man who killed his uh, father. Okay, yeah, he is the murderer, I am not going to, and then, then these 11 men against him, that is Lee Jacob a very powerful actor. Okay. So, um, coming back to Miller in 1940, he married uh, Mary Slattery and then uh, he wrote his one, his first play called The Man Who Had All the Luck. It is based on um, Henrik Ibsen's The Master Builder. Henrik Ibsen has written uh, the Norwegian playwright. So, this is uh, Miller's early days when he was influenced by European playwrights such as Ibsen. Ibsen was one of his most important early influences. Okay. And what kinds of plays is uh, Ibsen normally associated with? You know Doll's House, okay. you know um, you should also read The Master Builder. And uh, generally speaking, he is a writer of social realism. Okay. So, that is what, so early plays were in that same vein and you know All My Sons, perhaps some of you are familiar with All My Sons. It is a wonderful play about a man, a father who is a factory owner and uh, he sells faulty aircraft parts to um, during the war and uh, it results in uh, the death of 27 pilots, but he is he justifies that if I had not supplied those faulty air, air parts to the army, then I would have lost billions of millions of dollars and that would have hurt my family. Okay. But at the end, his son makes him realize that those 27 pilots who lost their life, they are also someone's son. So, at the end, he, the father shoots himself and uh, he says, he realizes that, that they were all my sons. Okay, so, this is you know this this uh, uh, this is very Greek, this is a tragedy in three acts and you see look at the Grecian element here, a son leading to or causing the death of his father, okay, father indirectly causing the death of his sons and then the one son his biological son causing the death of his father. 
So, it is uh, like a prototype Greek tragedy and it also follow, observes the unities of time, place and action and uh, is a very neatly, very tightly structured play in three acts. You can apply that freight tag triangle to this play very neatly. Okay. Um, <coughs> So, uh, All My Sons was a tremendous success on Broadway, you know what is Broadway and it, the play was uh, directed by Alaya Kazan. So, that is how those two, Miller was a Jew and Kazan was a Jew and they uh, got along very well, very famously and they were friends for a very long time, collaborators. They remained friends till Alaya Kazan named the names. Okay, and uh, that was the beginning of the end. And Alaya uh, um, Kazan, if you are interested in him, I keep coming back to him because he has such a central position in American, uh, in a canon of American stage and also on, in Hollywood. So, uh, he has written a, uh, his autobiography called A Life, which is a response to or which is, which offers some kind of justification to why he did what he did. So, Miller's autobiography is time bends, really extremely readable work and a life is Alaya Kazan's which is again a work of literature. So, I recommend if you are interested in these things. So, this is Kazan and Atha Miller during the production of All My Sons. Then Miller wrote uh, his most important play Death of a Salesman in 1949. The play won the Pulitzer, and uh, uh, it's a story of a salesman. I mean, it has been done so many times. It is one of the most produced plays of all time. And why is it so well received? Okay, because it tells the story. It's a very universal story. It tells uh, the story of an aging salesman who has two sons and their relationship. So it struck a universal chord okay, when you know father disappointed in his sons and what could be more universal than this theme. A father who is completely disappointed in his son and sons keep letting him down that the idea. So, death of a salesman, it is his metaphorical death and also literal death on screen. Willie Loman is the character here. Are you familiar with the play? Watched it somewhere? Dustin you did it? The, no, the Dustin Hoffman movie. Oh, you know the movie. Fine. So, you know, you are familiar with it. All right. Okay. So, this is the early poster of uh, Death of a Salesman on Broadway. And uh, this is, you know that the central character, he enters or arrives on the scene carrying two valises something like we call briefcases a uh, heavier version of not as heavy as a suitcase, but something. So, he is a traveling salesman. What does he sell? What does Willie Le Loman sell? He is an insurance He is a? He sells insurance. Oh, he dies, uh, he commits suicide because he wants to claim his insurance policy for his. But he is not an insurance salesman. No. Yeah, we are never told that. Oh. Yeah. But what does he sell? We are never told that. So, again the other day we were talking about Bunel, yeah, what is there in the box? We never know and scholars have done endless number of papers on what is there in Willie Loman's Wallace's, you do not know. What does he sell? Okay. It is just like he is a, your average American dad, okay, who is going for some you know, he is trying to make an honest living, he is going out to work, he comes back, okay, but year after year he gets just disappointment from his son and he, he, he tries, he thinks that he is, he has been doing all the right things. So, it is also an indictment of golden American dream. He feels that he has been doing all the right things all along. Okay. So, um, the play is also known for employing expressionism and expressionistic techniques. We have been talking about expressionism and cinema. M has lots of, for example, Fritz Lang's M has lots of uh, 
expressionistic devices. Do you remember which were? Balloon. You remember the balloon Im imagery? What happens to that? It's, it does not look like a child's balloon, it has a devilish face, right? Okay, in the hands of that person who is a child molester and a child killer, okay, it assumes that kind of a of an image. Okay, and uh, you find the uh, when Elsie does not return home and you find her ball, yeah, somewhere going, yes, yeah, so it is a very strong metaphor or an you know, image of evoking her death. And then you have those interplays of lights and shadows. Did you notice that? Okay. His sh shadow looming large on the wall when Elsie is coming out of the school. Okay. So, those are all expressionistic devices. So, we have done that, that uh, it was introduced in Germany, the movement was introduced in Germany. You already are familiar with Edward Munch's The Scream Painting. And in uh, uh, some of the early great playwrights associated are George Kasser and Ernest Toller, who used this device in their plays. And we also know that uh, uh, playwrights employed uh, expressionistic device in order to convey a sense of um, distortion and angst and paranoia and insanity. So, all we have done a cabinet of Dr. Caligari. Okay, so, all these were you know things to convey, uh, expressionism was used to convey these attitudes and tendencies. Yeah, the idea was that uh, you know the way into project, the way in which uh, subconscious thoughts are or the subjective inner real realities of the characters are played out. So, how do you show it on stage? So, through the through some devices like through some kind of uh, um, discordant music or some kind of exaggerated sets and lights and exaggerated performance and makeup, you show that this is an expressionist um, device in order to project the inner turmoil, the inner um, exaggeration and primitivism of the characters. So, uh, we know that uh, some of the major American uh, dramatists who are also associated as a great, uh, known as the great practitioners of expressionism on American stage, they are Eugene O'Neill of course, and one of his most important play, one is the hairy ape and also the emperor Jones. And then later Tennessee Williams used it to great success, to great effect in a streetcar name Desire. That was another play directed by Alaya Kazan, the play as well as the film. And then uh, I, I think I have already referred to uh, Elmer Rees and the adding machine, okay, where a human being is just regimented so much that he is reduced to being nothing more than an adding machine. He is an accountant. And, uh, he is a bookkeeper and he is called Mr. Zero. So, basically what was the purpose of expressionist, uh, expressionism to portray the dominant theme of horror over rampant industrialization, urbanization and almost present an apocalyptic vision of life. At one point Willie Loman, if you are, if you remember the film and if you remember the play, he says the grass does not grow here anymore. And if you remember the uh, poster that I just showed you, it has grass very prominently foreground, foregrounded. What does it show? The gra grass does not grow here anymore. Willie Loman says the grass does not grow here anymore in his neighborhood. What does it tell you? I think some of you must have come across your grandparents or even parents saying that there it used to be a green place wherever you are residing right now. Loss of fortunes. Loss of? Fortunes. Not necessarily, literal loss of greenery around. Okay. We are talking about urbanization and excessive development and industrialization. 
Okay, so what do you do when you have to build more buildings and industries? What what is the first thing you sacrifice? Yeah, you say you cut down trees, you cut down, uh, you pluck out grass, you need more land to construct more houses, apartment like houses. Okay, not I am not talking about the spacious bungalows, I am talking about the apartments that you are so. When you construct, when you need the land for constructing apartments, what do you sacrifice? The land and the greenery around it. So, the grass does not grow anymore, that is the idea. So, he, it, the play is also seen as a, you know desire to hark back at pre industrialized civilization where life was simpler and more peaceful. Okay. Again, you have to think of expressionism, scream. Okay. So, that was a howl. I scream against too much of development and industrialization. Any questions at this point? All right. Then uh, his um, next major and uh, major play was uh, *The Crucible*, published in or uh, performed in 1953. It's based upon. See, this was a response to McCarthy period. Okay, but uh, um, Miller based and did m much of his research on the Salem witch trials in 1692 in Massachusetts, where women were accused of practicing witchcraft and they were burnt at stake. So, why this kind of a story in 1953 then? What was the comparison? They were being accused, often falsely of. Falsely accused. So, false accusations, baseless, a society gone insane. So, that is what Miller tried to show in the crucible. The hero is John Proctor and his wife Elizabeth Proctor is accused of practicing witchcraft by their uh, uh, servant Abigail. And Abigail, we are told, uh, um, has passionate feelings towards the master of the house, John Proctor. Okay. So, she wants, what does she want? Why is she accusing the wife? She wants to get rid of the woman. So, that is what Miller is trying to say here, that many of these people, they are just trying to get rid of their rivals here. Okay. Anyone who is in power, so it is a great play about power structures and power dynamics and equations. So, you can apply those theories. Also, generally now today seen as a response to McCarthyism and you know the uh, background. And then since Miller himself was uh, a practicing member of uh, the left party and was ac actively involved with something called the Federal Theatre Project, which was an offshoot of the group theatre. See, the group disbanded but there was something like federal theater project also. Okay, so, they were all associate uh, groups where they practice certain kinds of socially, social issues driven plays and they wrote and discussed things like that. So, therefore, he too was accused of practicing witchcraft that was communism and he was called before HUAC and he refused to name names, okay, unlike his great friend Elia Kazan and uh, his colleague. Clifford ordered. So, he refused to name names and then he was threatened with imprisonment and all and even however that all that did not really happen. But there were people who were put behind bar and the other day we were talking about Dashiell Hammett and Lillian Hellman. Yeah, Dashiell Hammett was actually put behind the bars. So, this is uh, what he says uh, in 2000 he uh, wrote an article for uh, the Guardian, where he says that more than a political metaphor, more than a moral fate, the crucible as it developed over more than a year became the awesome experience of the power of human imagination inflamed, the poetry of suggestion and the tragedy of heroic resistance to a society possessed to the point of ruin. So, that is the importance of the crucible. See, recently, I do not know if some, uh, if you remember the incident where um, President Clinton uh, in 
1998 I think was accused of certain things with his intern Monica Lewinsky. Yeah. And he was accused of lying under oath and perjury. And then there were uh, cases of, I mean there was talk or discussion of impeachment. Okay. It did not really happen, but there was a discussion of impeachment. Now, at that point Miller again wrote a very powerful article and he wanted to know that what um, a, you know a sexual indiscretion of this nature, what has that got to do with the uh, president's uh, political acumen or political position, why? Okay. And then he said it is like Salem revisited, <laughs> so that is the article and it is a very well written piece. This is uh, Miller before the House and American activities when he was actually questioned and interrogated. And crucible has been several times uh, adapted, most uh, famously by uh, Jean Paul Sartre. And it was called, it is a movie, Sartre wrote the screenplay. It was called the Saucius, the Salam, that is the witches of yeah, Sa Sa Salem. And then uh, Miller wrote the screenplay for the movie The Crucible starring Daniel Day Lewis and Winona Ryder. Winona Ryder plays Abigail here. He wrote uh, A Double Bill in 1955, A Memory of Two uh, Mondays which is very autobiographical and it deals with his life, with his life in uh, the warehouse and he also wrote A View from the Bridge. What is uh, what's a double bill? You know a double bill movie. What is it, Dhananjan? You seem to know. When you go into the theatre, you see both. There is a part A and a part B. Part B will probably be a B movie or a, a less budget, low budget movie. Right, good. So, uh, Memory of Two Mondays was a lower budget play. A View from the Bridge was the main. So, they, it is staged on the same day. One is a shorter and low budget venture. The other one is more prominent, it is a double bill. It was also during this time when Marilyn Monroe entered his life and uh, um, Marilyn was uh, married to Joe DiMaggio, the great baseball superstar and uh, they divorced and uh, they married, uh, she stood by him during the HUAC trial. Famously, there are beautiful pictures of them hand in hand together during the trial and soon after the, uh, this marriage they left for England and where she was shooting for the prince and the showgirl with Lawrence Oliver. So, if you know the film, it is a wonderful film. I think my week with Marilyn is about that period in Miller and um, Monroe's life where Miller is really projected very badly. Yeah. So, this is Marilyn Monroe and Lawrence Olivier from The Prince and the Showgirl. Life with uh, Marilyn, they had a short lived marriage for just 5 years and uh, she did some of her greatest work during this marriage. So, uh, films like Bus Stop, Some Like It Hot. I think we did this clipping when we were doing the popular culture course and uh, it has those two men in drag, you remember? And then uh, uh, he wrote the, the screenplay for The Misfits. Misfits is also uh, another wonderful movie starring uh, Marilyn and Clark Gable and Montgomery Clift. So, um, this is the cast and crew of The Misfits. And then post, yeah, they divorced and uh, he wrote uh, a play called After the Fall which is now considered a classic. You know the fall, biblical fall you are aware of. Um, Adam is almost seduced by Eve and takes a bite into that apple and meets his own. So, you can look at the title and draw parallels on your own, what he meant, what fall he has gone through. It was a very bitter divorce. And uh, it is also, uh, uh, the title is also inspired by Camus, Albert Camus. Who is he? 
yeah, French Algerian uh, writer and existentialist philosopher. So, he has written a novella called The Fall and it is also inspired. Some of the scenes are like it is a homage to or it is an inspiration from Camus The Fall. So, uh, this is the one of the more recent versions of the play and you can see the girl, the actress who is playing the wife and you see there is an uncanny re resemblance between you know who and the girl. Um, and then uh, Miller in the 60s and the 70s, he wrote a wonderful play called Incident at Vichy, very uh, well received and it is also a very popular play, which is about Holocaust, Vichy is in France and Holocaust in French and German occupied, Nazi occupied France. Okay, then uh, he wrote The Price, which is also a much performed play about his relationship with his less successful brother. Okay. And then uh, the American clock, it is about the depression uh, years and creation of the world, it is a, it's a satire, it is again about Adam and Eve legend revisited. Um, Miller as an activist, so he was the president of uh, PEN, that is PEN, uh, Society for Playwrights and poets, essays and novelists and uh, he took an active part during the later part of his life, he became uh, actively involved in supporting writers in exile and uh, Alexander Sauls Hennison and also Salman Rushdie, they owe him a lot for speaking for them. He wrote a number, I mean he remained very active towards the, even till the end of his life and uh, he has written a number of great plays in the 80s and the 90s. Um, one is a, a much performed play is a Ride Down Mount Morgan. This is Death of a Salesman with Dustin Hoffman and John Malkovich. And this is a poster from The Crucible. Um, so, uh, some of his last plays, they were Mr. Peter's Connections, which is again very autobiographical in tone. Now, um, we, uh, uh, the la last, some of the last part, uh, last uh, plays of his life, they are not so well remembered for right or wrong reasons. But now, coming back to why we remember, what is the importance of Miller, Miller and especially in today's times? So, what is so important about Miller that we are still interested in him? So, he has written a famous essay and that is available freely online, it is called Tragedy and the Common Man, Tragedy and the Common Man, which is a response to Aristotle's concept of the ideal tragic hero. Now, who is an ideal tragic hero? I am sure you know that. Shilpa, who is an ideal tragic hero? Uh, something extraordinary about him, he is, uh, so he is worthy of a hero's uh, attention, but he also has a fatal flaw that leads Good. to the tragedy. Okay, so he is, uh, uh, he is worthy, he is a worthy man, but um, why Miller want, was interested in that idea or ideal of a tragic hero? Because uh, uh, according to Aristotle, he has to be high born. Do you remember? So, not anyone, you remember the uh, definition, slaves and women are not eligible to apply, need not apply, okay? they do not qualify, slaves and women. So, they cannot be ideal tragic heroine, it has to be a male of a high stature, that is and there has to, there was a fatal flaw. So, you look at Hamlet, Shakespeare drew his tragedies from this concept of an ideal tragic hero, right? So, Hamlet is a prince, what is his flaw? What is Heather's flaw? His indignation. Okay, thinks too much, procrastinates. Okay, what is Macbeth's flaw? Too over ambitious and what is Othello's flaw? He is too rash. Okay. Sexual jealousy, yes, but uh, he is uh, an opposite of 
Hamlet who thinks a lot but does not act and Othello uh, acts rashly and does not stop to think. Okay, so, those are the fatal flaw of the Greek word is Hamashia. Yeah. So, um, why we are interested in uh, Miller's and his take on ideal tragic hero is that Miller um, responded to Aristotelian concept that today in 20th century okay, common man is an apt subject to be called an ideal tragic hero. So, his heroes are not high born nobles. He says when there are no princes and princesses anymore, how do we respond to this theory, this idea. So, a common man is as apt a subject of a tragedy as any high born person that is here. So, all his heroes are, he says they are also ideal tragic heroes. For example, uh, uh, heroes in Tennessee Williams, they have other kinds of problems, but they are hero nevertheless. But he says his heroes, Miller's heroes especially, they may not be high born, but otherwise they have all the qualities and characteristics of ideal tragic hero. That is his theory of tragedy and therefore, we credit him for democratization of tragedy. He brought tragedy to the level of the common man. Okay, common man is an apt subject. Any comment here or question? It is similar to what Dreiser did with uh, an American tragedy. Once again, the common man is the is, focus. Yeah. So, see, uh, it is good thing that you raise this uh, topic because uh, uh, Dreiser's uh, novel was also turned into a play adapted for stage, right. We were the other day we were talking about Brecht and all. So, this play, this novel was adapted for stage where the hero, he was given a hero's treatment except the strong materialistic tendencies in him. Yes. So, he is an apt subject for becoming a hero. This is taken from the play, the stage play, finishing the picture. So, what is his legacy? He is credited with the democratization of tragedy. His plays are in accessible language. We call him, we, call, uh, we all often refer to the Greek influences because the themes of guilt and responsibility are extremely conspicuous in all his plays. And then he has been a formative influence on generation of American players, particularly David Meme and his Glengarry Glen Ross, which is read as a modern day death of a salesman. Okay. Then also Tony Kushner, Angels in America and uh, there again you see his concern with uh, the rape of democracy in America. When was it written? Angels in America? So, it is also a play of its times, you know it, is, it was written during Reagan's America. Okay, so, that is what he felt and John Goer if you read 6 degrees of separation and you look at the way he has handled the problem of racism in America. So, all these people who owe their indebtedness to, Amer to Arthur Miller. Okay. So, we end with that, thank you very much.